we need women specific organizations because there was a time during the epidemic that uh, women were told that women didn't contract HIV, we just died from it. Um, we feel that today we need, a, we need a leadership pipeline of women so that we can bring our unique perspective to the table. Positive Women's Network is a national membership body of women. We represent 300,000 women in this country living with HIV and we train them in policy analysis so that we're able to sit at decision-making tables that we can have input and influence over policies and procedures that impact our lives. Nothing about us without us. The regional differences today in 2017 with women, amongst women living with HIV in the world, let me say this, we own this disease worldwide. We're over 65% of the global epidemic of HIV. In this country, in the United States, the states where you see the most impact of women living with HIV, or we call it the nine southern states, those are also the same states where they, where they, they haven't had Medicaid expansion. Not to say that women aren't being impacted everywhere, but there's a huge impact in the southern regions of the United States of women living with HIV. We can only see an epidemic like HIV when there has been some violations of human rights. HIV is just a symptom of some of these social issues that we have yet to address as a, as a community or as a country. And people are living um, below the, the level of human dignity. And people are living in survival mode and making decisions based upon their own um, you know, personal needs and survival. When people are homeless, when people can't read, when people are hungry, people have to make decisions. When you have mass incarceration that, that deteriorates and destabilizes communities, people don't have the voting power, they don't have the power to have safe sexual relationships because there's a big, a big balance there, not, a, there are not enough guys. So when we talk about the intersections of HIV, we're talking about our environment that we actually connect with every day. It's not always the sex act. It's not always the drug use, but it's the entire environment. So everything becomes our business. Women then with HIV have traditionally been coerced into not having families, traditionally been coerced into having sterilization procedures, and not always advise that they can be sexual beings, not always advise that they have sexual rights or uh, reproductive justice rights. HIV criminalization oftentimes leaves women at a place where they lose custody of their children. They are no longer able to work in what we call traditional jobs for women. They can't be school teachers. They can't work in nursing homes. They can't live near schools if they get a, a felony charge of HIV criminalization. Um, it really impacts their ability to parent their child. Women then with HIV have faced some violence, you know, somewhere in their lives. That seems to be one of the connecting factors, one of the, one of the, um, um, uh, one of the areas that you just can't ignore. So the president, this was President Barack Obama, he did put together a federal agency uh, to look at and research if violence and HIV amongst women was connected. And we found that there was a huge intersection, not just intimate partner violence, but violence and trauma. So um, we were asking for trauma-informed care so that women are getting the care that they need for trauma that's never been addressed. Women just don't show up. We show up with a lot of things behind us. We show up with the children. We show up with the husband. We show up with the, with the sick in-law. You know, we're caretakers. We show up knowing when everybody's supposed to take their medicine except us. We show up knowing everybody's appointments and remembering everybody's appointments except ours. You know, so with women, we, we come with extra responsibilities. What impacts women generally impacts the families. And what impacts the families impacts the communities. I have had some difficulties um, with living with HIV, being a Muslim woman. Just as people who are Christian or other faiths have had some difficulties. What I have learned is that I also have a responsibility to teach my community how to respond to me. When I first, when I first became positive for HIV, 
And I told some of the sisters at the masjid about it. They questioned my suitability. Do you think you ought to be here praying on the rug? Like, like being personally with HIV would contaminate the masjid in some kind of way. And that really hurt. That hurt me in a really, really deep place. And what I have learned through the years is that I absolutely need to be um, praying on the rug. I need to be praying on the rug, on the wall. I need to be praying everywhere, you know? Our places of faith have a responsibility in this epidemic. And I don't think they really know what their places are. What are our obligations to the sick? What are our obligations to the hungry? What are our obligations to the poor? And what are our obligations to those who are locked away? Because all of the scriptures seem to have these obligations that we come to them, that we nurture them, that we pray for them, that we pray with them. You know, what, what I've seen is that we get the barriers, the hands go up, the minds get closed, and, and the persons, the people living with HIV are left in isolation. Thank God we have each other. Thank God that we have each other because that is what has, that's what has, what has held us together is being able to have each other and that goes across faith. In 2003, I was in a bad place in my life and I got incarcerated. I got incarcerated as a direct, as a direct result of a drug addiction. And during that six months, the health department would come in, give us lectures on HIV, STDs, offer testing. I always said no, wasn't my business, you know. And after being there for about three or four months, I decided, oh, what the heck, I'll go and it'll get me off the block. It'll get me to walk around. When the uh, health department took me into the room and they gave me the results, I remember the lady saying, I'm so sorry, Ms. Shabazz. She says, I'm so sorry. Your test came back positive for HIV. And before I could even like in internalize what she was saying, and she kept saying, I'm so sorry, it's AIDS. And I'm still, I'm, I just went back there to where I was and like, how, how does that happen? And I was, I was just a, a, a total liquid meltdown. And I remember her asking me, was there someone I wanted to call? At this point, I felt like I had ruined my life enough. Um, who could I call? Who could I call? You know, um, I screwed up. I'm in jail. I have AIDS. I'm dying. And who, who could I call? So the organization that I work for now in Philadelphia called Philadelphia Fight happened to have an outreach program, which they still do, with the Philadelphia County Jails. John Bell from Act of Philadelphia happened to be working at Philadelphia Fight as a linkage specialist to the prisons. And he came in and told me that he had been living with AIDS for 20 years, that I was going to die, not to worry. There were some people waiting for me when I got out and that everything was going to be okay. And um, that was enough for me to just hold on to. When I got to act up and I walked in that room, I'm like, what is this? There was the white guy with the dreadlocks. There was the lady with the beard and the mustache. And there was somebody else. And I'm looking around. There were no people. Of, there, were, there were people of color, Latina. And there were some black people there, but there were no black women there. And John Bell said to me, he says, Wahida, you, you have to stay in place. He said, because more black women are coming. He said, and when they come and they don't see anybody that looks like them, they're not going to stay. They're going to think this is not for them. And it wasn't just a support group. I was going to support groups. This was different. This was a little bit different. No one here was crying. No one was weeping. We didn't have a box of tissues in the middle of the floor. This was something different. There was a board. There was a chalkboard. And they were strategizing. And, and there was this, this um, agenda um, that was set up. And it was set up in a way that everything got done. Everything on the agenda got done. I was like, whoa, I like this. They started teaching me how to, how to write speeches and how to say speeches and how to practice speeches and how to put my own self into the speech. And they told me that the, that the personal was political. You know, and so these are the kind of things that, um, that sparked my activism. When I got the courage to finally to, to disclose my status and openly, we were at a big event, it was a prison summit. 
and um, I was not going to disclose, but a friend of mine was. I was going to stand there with her because I didn't think anybody should do that by themselves. I remember getting to the mic with this, in the third party, poem that I was going to read or this story I was going to tell about those poor women I saw in jail, which was all about me. And I asked if John Bell was in the room. It was a big room. It was about 250 people in the room. And I asked if John Bell was in the room, could John Bell come up front? And I could hear the people backstage saying, she's going to say it. She's going to say it. And I knew I was going to say it. And so I had disclosed. Not to my family, but I had disclosed to a whole room of 250 people. I'm like, what happens next? You know, what, where do I go from here?